Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation of uh, Justice for the Dead. This is our latest entry into a series of uh, webinars presented by our really exciting and dynamic African American History Program, which is part of the New Jersey Historical Commission under the leadership of Noelle Lorraine Williams, the, and you're going to meet her in just a moment. Um, tonight's program, Justice for the Dead, could not be more uh, relevant or appropriate for the New Jersey Historical Commission and for our goals. One of our fundamental priorities is to encourage the research, exploration, and enjoyment of history of the state of New Jersey, and with a particular priority on lifting up those histories that have been underrepresented, un undiscovered, underappreciated, and need to be better known. So tonight's presentation could not be more on point. We're, we're truly excited to have our two wonderful speakers, Reverend Dr. Wanda Lundy, pastor of the Siloam Hope First Presbyterian Church, an extremely historic church, as you're gonna to hear tonight, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and Christopher Lopez, an artist, educator, and public historian. And I'm excited to hear both of their presentations. But I wanna acknowledge two of our staff members uh, from the New Jersey Historical Com uh, Commission who are really the masterminds behind tonight's program. Um, first, I wanna acknowledge uh, Rachel Timkey, who will be our webmaster uh, this evening, and then Noelle Lorraine Williams, the director of our African American History Program, who will be our host for this evening and really has put this wonderful series together. So with that, I wanna um, introduce Noelle Lorraine Williams and let her guide us through this evening's program. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah, so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here this evening. Um, unfortunately, Carol McCarthy will not be able to present this evening, um, and she sends her regrets. Okay, so I have been looking forward to um, this discussion for a while. Um, it's called Welcome to the Justice for the Dead, Reconstructing the Hidden Histories of African Americans and Latinos in New Jersey. Um, we will highlight the ways in which public historians from around New Jersey uplift stories of injustice from our state past. Um, we are welcoming Reverend Dr. Wanda Lundy of the 313 Ancestors Speak Research Project in Elizabeth, as Sarah indicated, and Christopher Lopez, um, the curator of the exhibition, The Fires, Hoboken, 1978 to 1982. As many of you know, we are now in a very strong resurgence of interest on how we honor the histories, material, and spiritual objects of dispossessed communities around the nation and in this state. Community members have utilized history, research, and culture to reimagine stories that have been hidden or silenced. For example, in late 2023, the Department of the Interior announced a final rule to revise regulations that implement the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, otherwise known as NAGPRA, which was enacted in 1990. These regulations will provide systematic processes for returning Native American remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony to lineal descendants, Indian tribes, and Native American, Native Hawaiian organizations. As Secretary Deb Holland said, quote, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act is an essential tool for the safe return of sacred objects to the communities from which they were stolen. Among the updates we are implementing are critical steps to strengthen the authority and the role of indigenous communities in the repatriation process. Finalizing these changes is an important part of laying the groundwork for the healing of our people. And I would also say for all people. On another note um, regarding African-American burial grounds, the New York Times states, that quote, more than 6 million people died while enslaved within the boundaries of today's United States, according to a recent article 
by a demographic historian at the University of Minnesota, yet only a tiny fraction of their graves can be found today, too often lost beneath industrial complexes, golf courses, hospitals, and even municipal buildings, end quote. On December 29th, 2022, the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act was actually signed into law. This bill directs the Department of the Interior's Interior to establish the United States African American Burial Grounds Preservation Program within the National Park Service related research and documentation for historic African American burial grounds. We here at the New Jersey Historical Commission will continue to support the research, um, exhibition work, interpretation of community sites and community organizations that work to preserve these histories. Here in New Jersey, sites such as Mount Peace Cemetery and today's guests, the 313 plus Ancestors Ancestor Speak Research Project are doing the diligent work to highlight these histories. Now I will introduce to you our first panelist. Christopher Lopez is a Puerto Rican lens-based artist, educator, and public historian. He was born in the Bronx and was raised between New York and New Jersey. He has been working as a visual artist since 2005. To date, many of his works have been based on historical figures and events on the island of Puerto Rico. Often exploring diminishing histories, his projects celebrate both the richness of culture and the inherent complexities of identity and place as they are experienced in Puerto Rico and the diaspora. Christopher has been awarded fellowships at the Laundromat Project and the Diaspora Solidarities Lab with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. He is a current member of Diversify Photo, an initiative started to diversify the photography industry and has lectured at Cornell University, Michigan State University, and Barnard College among others. Amongst others. His artworks are currently in the permanent collection of El, Mil El Museo del Barrio, the World Trade Center Memorial Museum, and the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Uh, please join me in welcoming Christopher Lopez. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so very much, uh, Noelle, for this uh, invitation to speak on this panel. Um, I believe in the work that the Historical Commission does in um, creating public knowledge and uh, promoting and advocating um, untold histories uh, throughout the state. Um, uh, the work that I do um, as an artist and a public historian is very much in line um, with that work um, in contributing um, to the history of our state um, um, through the varied histories that, that, that we share. Um, I think that, um, the work that I do is really, really important, um, in sort of fostering these untold stories. Uh, my most recent project, um, is based in Hoboken, New Jersey, um, in which I address, uh, the history of gentrification in the city. Um, with a concentration on fires that happened there in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, so essentially what my work is and the um, slides that I'll show, the presentation that I created will sort of kind of walk us through um, a bit of that work um, and some of those stories. Um, so I will go ahead and pull up my slides now. <clears throat> Um, so I had an exhibition, um, of the work, uh, which was the first showing of the work at the Hoboken Historical, um, Museum in 2023. Um, initially we had, 
uh, it was only supposed to run for like a six month engagement, um, but it got extended for a year. Um, it was by popular demand. Um, this show in and of itself um, was something that I did not expect of the project. Uh, I think the impact that the, the show had on the community um, was really overwhelming. And so, you know, it's why it was extended for the year long engagement. Um, it was a really beautiful thing to witness. Um, so many people um, gathering in the museum um, to what seemed like for the very first time um, be able to convene communally um, to share their stories. Um, and to sort of grieve it, it almost grieve for the very first time. Um, Hoboken today, um, as compared to that time in the 70s and the 80s and before, um, is almost unrecognizable um, in large part because of uh, overdevelopment of the city. Um, Hoboken historically, uh, before the 70s, um, was a middle class working community working city um that uh who, that was very that had a lot of industry um and middle class families um a lot of textile companies and famous companies like candy companies like Tootsie Roll and and uh Wonder Bread and things like that pretty interesting history actually of industry um and 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 also um, longshoremen that would work on the docks um, and for the shipping industry, um, which uh, eventually became decimated uh, in the 60s, uh, in large part because of containerization. Uh, that industry had moved and expanded uh, by containers. The, the advent of containerization moved over to Newark, and so that hurt the city. And so... Um, yeah, my work it concentrates again on on this history, this this history of gentrification. Um, that I think, so, you know, people know that Hoboken is a gentrified place. They just don't know how that came to be. And um, my work is uh, an attempt at sort of um, offering that how, you know, and what and at what cost. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to read a passage from the show statement that was written by the um, director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, um, Dr. Yermaira Figueroa Vasquez, um, um, who was uh, kind enough to, to, to lend her brilliant words uh, to the show. So I'm going to read a part of it. Um, for y'all. More than documentary photography, the artist engages in interviews, archival work, site visits, and portraiture. He traces the jagged edges of this history and tends to the wounds induced by its erasure. The work retells the stories of resistance and survival in the face of the city's reluctance to revisit this pain chapter in its history. In doing so, he allows us to perceive the decades long effects of what geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls organized abandonment. The withdrawal of care, resources, and concern for the lives and well being of residents, which was evidenced by the lack of smoke detectors, the blaming of victims for their living conditions, the creation and exacerbation of residential deterioration. This form of abandonment resulted in arsons and fires for vulnerable populations considered unimportant or movable in the face of a reimagined Hoboken. Despite the pressure to change the narrative, to equivocate or deflect, thereby protecting the interests and feelings of developers and current residents, the goal of this work is to underscore what is owed to the families who lost their lives, the many children who were taken and the many survivors who live on the trauma of loss. The Fires offers us an opportunity to sit with the memories of those who survived systemic displacement and centers those voices, those lived experiences. And so again, this is from the show statement. Um, 
that was there at the, the Hoboken Historical uh, Museum. Um, the exhibition has now moved to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at the Silberman Building and will run there until June 30th um, in Harlem, in East Harlem. Um, so again, um, yeah, I mean, the work very much is about telling these untold stories, uh, this untold history um, that is, you know, in large part, just deliberately silenced, right? Um, it's not a pretty thing what happened uh, in the city. It's not a pretty thing. It's not a glamorous thing that happens to our cities, um, um, you know, that are, are, are predominantly populated by communities of color um, and how those communities are dispossessed of their land, um, of their livelihoods, um, and, and through violent displacement, as happened in Hoboken. Um, and so, you know, the work is very much about, um, I guess, giving voice for the very first time um, to these individuals. Um, I, when I started researching this work, um, in early January, in January of 2021, um, you know, I spent, you know, almost a year researching archives, um, which is, you know, going through all of the newspaper articles and uh, any other artifacts and reading materials that I could find at the historical museum um, and online. And so, you know, after, you know, after all of that research and, you know, taking notes and creating a timeline of my own, um, I knew pretty immediately um, that the thing that was missing, missing most from these happenings um, were the voices of the people. And so um, that's, that's what I tasked myself um, in doing was um, making contact um, with these people whose names were just names in these newspapers um, and uh, to try to establish contact and to, to try to make contact with them and allow them the opportunity to be able to um, tell their story, you know, share their experiences. Um, and so that, that, that's very much what, what the project is rooted in, is sort of the reconciliation of this history um, made by the people who, who experienced it. Um, so I can share some slides um, with some of the photographs um, with captions. Um, so uh, again, the project is an oral history project in which I, I record oral history from my subjects. Um, but then as a visual artist, as a photographer, um, I work to try and offer and create visual depictions of this history um, um, now, today, you know, as something that, you know, as a history is like, seem, you know, abandoned, you know, and sort of just kind of lives in this sort of old newspaper, you know, it's, I think it's important to, to, to create, um, collaboratively with these families um, to, to show their place now that they exist to date. Yeah. So this was uh, one um, boy that had died um, in an arson fire in 1981, Modesto Echevarria. Um, and he was killed in an arson fire um, in his apartment at 67 Park Avenue. Um, and they were found in, in, in their bathtub. It took uh, two or three days um, for the fire department to be able to find them. Um, and so again, I mean, you know, I, I had seen this image in the newspaper um, and it had listed the photographer. I had reached out to the photographer. We had a conversation which is recorded and, and a part of the archive now of his experiences as a journalist uh, working during those times. Um, he was kind enough to send me the negative of this photograph. This photograph was initially printed in the newspaper. 
and he sent me the negative and then I had I had printed it burned it in my bathtub and then photographed it and this is another uh another image that I made on that day Um, another, uh, person, um, who I was able to make contact with and interview, um, Antonio Olavaria, um, also survived a fire, um, when he was nine years old at the building that Modesto Echavaria died in. He actually remembers the boy. Um, Antonio was nine. Um, when when he was able he was able to survive and you know he he jumped from the his apartment which was like on the fourth floor and hurt himself and so um, you know we had formed a relationship and had many many conversations for months um, before this photograph was made um, the first day that I met with him we had made this photograph together. And so here he's showing me a picture that his mom sent him because his mom knew that I was coming to speak with him. And she also took that picture, that photograph of him in the hospital. And so after, you know, months of um, sort of conversations with each other, getting to know one each other, um, I had realized that probably the most important picture that I could make of him was was of him with his son. Um, he was the he's the coach for his son's soccer team and his football team, and he just just loved his son. You know, I knew that that would be the picture that would you know show him. This is another family that survived an arson fire in 1978. Um, they're a family that immigrated from Peru. Um, and, you know, in the caption here, you can read, um, you know, there, there was this, you know, he, he had this uh, interaction with whom he thought was a real estate agent who had sort of warned him to say, hey, you, you might want to consider really getting out of that building. Um, you know, I guess he had been like, yeah, I've been trying, but it's hard. We, there's nowhere to live. Like, no one will take kids. <laughs> and so the next day after that altercation, uh, there was a fire. You know, a lot of these fires happened in the early morning, three in the morning. Everybody's home. Everybody's asleep. And uh, and I made this picture of them. This was one of the only things that, that, that survived the fire. They all survived, but um, this is the only thing that they were able to salvage. Um, this is uh, another um, subject uh, of the project, uh, a woman that... Um, is holding a sign of all of the family that she lost in a devastating fire in 1982 at the Pinter Hotel. Um, again, you know, this photograph, you know, this was, we we had engaged in, in, in conversations with each other for about a year before this photograph was realized. Um, another person who was affected by the same, that same fire, the Pinter Hotel fire, is this woman, Maria Feliz. Um, as a, you know, after the fire, um, she, she lost, she lost her grandmother and her brother in a fire in the, in the Pinter Hotel fire. 
Um, that fire killed 13 people in total. Um, the fires in the years 1978 to 1982 had killed 56 people, um, mostly Puerto Rican people, mostly children. Um, and so she and her mom had survived the fire, but her brother and her grandmother had not. Um, her mother had began abusing um, substance, uh, drugs. Shortly after that, the grief of losing her mom and her son. And so she wasn't able to care for her daughter, care for Maria. And so, you know, um, again, you know, I've been talking to Maria for a year more um, about, about that, you know, about, about that experience. And so ultimately, uh, she lost her mom. You know, her mom didn't die in the fire, but, you know, sort of like in a way did. Right. And so she became estranged from her mom for most of her most of her life. Uh, fortunately, before she passed, they were able to sort of reconcile and they became friends, you know, in the last in the last years of her life. But she went most of her life without her mom. And that's because of that fire. And that's because of gentrification. Um, in the course of a year, um, you know, she had kept telling me that she always wanted to make a memorial shirt for her mom and for her brother. And so I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to make that for them, for her and her four boys. She's actually wearing it in this photograph. Yeah. This photograph was made uh, on on her mother's birthday. Her mother had passed, but it was made on her mother's birthday. And so there was a balloon uh, release ceremony for her mom. I was able to photograph that as well. Um. So that's my presentation. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for listening in on uh, the project and the work. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Christopher, for sharing that. And then um, maybe during the question and answer, if you want to um, play the sound file. Um, yeah, so yeah, I can. We can um, do that. Wow. So, you know, I saw the exhibition and, um, you know, um, it's just very uh, powerful piece. I, I look forward to our question and answer regarding it. Likewise. Thanks a lot. Sure. Okay. Um, and so now for the second part of our presentation, I'm going to introduce Reverend Dr. Wanda M. Lundy. She is the pastor at Salon, she'll have to correct me, Salam, um, First, Salam Hope. First Presbyterian Church in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She is also the executive director of the Elizabeth Port Presbyterian Center. Uh, Reverend Dr. Lundy is currently engaged in the 313 Plus Ancestors Speak Research Project, an initiative researching the identity of free and enslaved African people buried in unmarked graves in the Siloam Hope First Presbyterian Church in Elizabeth, New Jersey Cemetery. One of its goals was to establish a monument that honors and sustains the memory of their families and their contributions to the history of First Presbyterian Church and to the city of Elizabeth, New Jersey. The monument was unveiled during the Elizabeth Juneteenth celebration in June, 2023. 
this project is linked to New York. This project is linked to New York Theological Seminary's mentoring track entitled Mentoring for Thriving in the Ministry in the City, which is purposed to develop, sorry. Which is purposed to develop meaningful connections with pastors and ultimately congregations in the city. Fusing these bonds will yield, yield positive and sustainable influences in their personal life, spiritual experiences, and community. Lundy is an ordained Presbyterian minister and has 37 years of experience in pastoral, institutional, and academic ministry. She was the inaugural moderator of the newly formed Presbytery of Northeast New Jersey. Her travel venues include Cuba, Brazil, Israel, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, Honduras, Senegal, and Korea. Um, she is a graduate of Alabama A&M University, um, Howard University School of Divinity, and the Theological Seminary, uh, Johnson C. Smith Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, New York Theological Seminary, and um, she is currently a PhD student with the Crawfee Crystaller Institute of Theology, Mission, and Culture. Um, her expertise includes criminal justice issues, drug rehabilitation issues, and personal and church transformation. She is married to Curtis Lundy, a jazz musician with two children, Love and Luckman. Um, please welcome Reverend Dr. Wanda Lundy. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are welcome. I'm grateful to the New Jersey Historical Commission for allowing me this opportunity. Special thanks to Noel Lorraine Williams, the Director of African American Program, to Sarah Curitan, who is the Director of the New Jersey Historical Commission. I am excited to be here with you this evening and um, also want to thank Christopher for that amazing presentation and bringing those stories to life. In 2019, during a Four Centuries in a Weekend event, Four Centuries in a Weekend is an annual Union County event that invites the community to visit all of the historical sites in Union County. Our church property has two sites that are on the historical list, and that is the church and Snyder Academy. I had just gotten to the church in uh, October of 2019, did not even know about Elizabeth, New Jersey in 2019, but was excited to be in this new place with a group of uh, people of faith who wanted to continue on, uh, on a new journey that they were beginning. Someone made the announcement in church on this Sunday that they needed volunteers because uh, four centuries in a weekend was coming up and visitors were gonna be coming to the campus and I thought to myself, well, I don't know the history, but I have some extra hands and I'll come and help and do what I can. So I come, it was an amazing, beautiful uh, day. The, um, they had reenactors who were on the property uh, showing um, the, uh, the, during the, rep the uh, revolutionary period, they had a person who was a reenactor uh, showing a tea party in the, in the church. Uh, there were young people out uh, playing music. It was just a beautiful, they had the tents up. It was amazing. I had not seen anything like that. So I went over to Snyder Academy where there's a museum. And so I'm just looking around, looking at the artifacts uh, that are in the cemetery that belong to the church. And I looked up and I saw this picture and I want to share it with you because all of this time, I had not heard anything about Blacks. I heard all amazing history about those who were a part of the story of this, of this place. Um, Alexander Hamilton went to school in Snyder Academy. Um, they're the founders of the, um, the country are affiliated. Just amazing, amazing work. But I hadn't heard anything about Black people. And I'm always looking for myself, right, when I go into a space. Well, I went into the museum and I saw this picture. 
And I saw the little black boy and I got so excited. I said to the person who was in the museum, I finally see a black person. And uh, she said to me, oh yeah, you know, there's 313 slaves buried in the cemetery. I said, I said, what did you say? I, she said, oh yeah, you know where you've been parking every Sunday? They're over in that area. I, it took my breath away. Uh, I, it stopped me in my tracks to hear this information. Um, it was, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Even every time I talk about it, I, I remember how that hit me that in that cemetery, I knew that there was something special for me when I drove in the in the parking lot on that sem on that campus, and when she told me that, all of a sudden I understood, you know, what my calling was. After just reflecting on it and talking with people about it, and remembering how I felt on that property, I clearly heard the ancestors say, "We want our names called. You calling all of these other names? You know about all of these other people, but we want our names called and we want our stories told." And I'm going to ask if our first video would be shared now. Give me one moment, technology. Okay. Ancestors. And if you call a person's name, they continue to live on. Why? is it important that we honor our ancestors? That really is the question. Why do we remember them? We have 313, potentially up to 384, even more ancestors who are in unmarked graves. And when I came onto this property, I heard them say clearly to me, we want our names called, we want our stories told. I didn't even know what I was tracking until I came to this facility. And coming on the grounds of the facility, it opened up ancestral voices that I never even would have imagined. I was blown away by the story. It, the, the history is just unbelievable. There is an African proverb, or the ancestors once said, to know who you are is the beginning of wisdom. You need to know who you are, where you came from, what you came from. I've only been employed here in the city close to three years. It was all new for me. But uh, Chief Saka was also a native of the city, was blown away. And I've spoken to many residents and natives of the city of Elizabeth. Uh, one gentleman who's close to 80 years old, who, who proclaimed to be a, a self-historian, and I always tease him when I see him now, says, how come you didn't know about this? He's actually, a, he was a, he's a great historian on African-American history, and he always gives me books to read, and he was just stunned, and I'm still, every time I come here. Without us looking back, without us doing this research, we can't begin to move forward in a positive way. The Africans here were not recognized, and I can remember myself as a child coming here, field trips with my school, to really study the cemetery and look at the people who had passed away, and never know that there were people like myself who existed here. Um, in this cemetery, who even existed in the city. If they were enslaved, they were soldiers. They did all of their footwork. So they were on the front lines. They, they were as much responsible for the democracy of this nation as the, the soldiers that we gave rec give recognition to. It's really important that we find all the ancestors who are buried here and to acknowledge our history the good parts and the not so good parts of our history. It's a monument, a 23 foot monument. We are awarded the annual history grant from the County of Union, and we usually host our historical reenactment right here on the premises of the church and cemetery. So in doing so, we heard about the 313 plus project and how the church is embarking on this journey and we said how great it would be to become part of that process and document your journey. Rafael Rodriguez, who was a member of First Church, his goal was to build a monument for the 313 plus enslaved and freed black people. And this is for everyone. Everyone who hears my voice, it is a call to you. The ancestors are speaking. They want their names called and they want their stories told.
Thank you. So as we um, continue to talk, I would like to use the, the theme standing on holy ground, the unmarked graves of our ancestors, Ancestors Speak Project, because truly the property of 42 Broad Street for me is holy ground. It is a place that our ancestors, all of our ancestors have spent time. We stand on their shoulders. Um, and so uh, I was struck by just thinking of the scripture in Exodus when God talked to Moses and said, uh, then God said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have learned more about cemetery preservation than I, than I expected. I started out by saying I came to the church to preach. Uh, I was invited by the congregation and I was introduced to the ancestors. So quickly, I wanna just share with you a little bit about um, this, what I've learned. Uh, in our cemetery, there are five different types of uh, markers. The, the materials that they're made of. They're sandstone, marble, granite, brick, and stucco. And we also have one material, one uh, marker that's zinc. I also found out that there's more than one type of headstone. Uh, markers, they are called. So we have uh, six. Headstone, we have the obelisk, we have the tomb, we have the basal, which is uh, more on the ground flat, similar to the table. We have several different types of table. This one is one that's closer to the ground, but we have taller ones and we have six vaults um, that are also on the property. Also in the cemetery, there, there are trees and trees tell stories. I mean, they hold the history. Uh, they, if trees could talk, what would they say? Uh, the story is told that Alexander Hamilton used to walk through the cemetery reciting his lessons and he would sit in front of a tree to study. It would be amazing to, to be able to have a conversation with one of those trees, even as our ancestors watched. We have one champion tree and three heritage trees. We have one tree that is uh, approximately 130 years old. It was planted approximately 1891, a champion tree. We have a tree that was planted in approximately 1887, about 134 years old, a tulip tree. We have a European beech that was planted approximately 1798, about 223 years old. And our oldest tree is a Northern red oak that was planted in approximately 1780. It is about 241 years old. All of this is a part of the story. I wanna now introduce a little bit of the history of the First Presbyterian Church this is a sketch that was done um, before uh, Elizabeth was built up. This is a short, a quick picture of the cemetery. I invite you to come and visit. This is what uh, Snyder Academy looks like uh, from Broad Street. This is the place that Alexander Hamilton um, went to school as well as Aaron Burr, even though they didn't go at the same time. So now I'm going to share with you a video to give you more information. Um, I think this would be helpful to learn more about the history of the church as well as, I hope that you are able to see this. Or can you affirm that you can see this? Is my, am I screen sharing? You are screen sharing, it's currently loading. Welcome back to Jersey Matters. We're taping on a rainy day in Lakewood, New Jersey. Hey, did you know that Elizabeth, not Trenton, was the first capital of New Jersey? And it wasn't named after Queen Elizabeth, but Elizabeth Carteret, who was a wealthy landowner in colonial times. That city has so much history. And now our Vanessa Tyler reveals a bit of history that many thought would stay buried. Larry, there is so much history in plain sight, often overlooked, like this graveyard behind the First Presbyterian Church on Broad Street in Elizabeth. Here lies those who shaped New Jersey and the spirit of America. This is the most historic cemetery in the state of New Jersey. The headstones here prove it. 
time may have worn away many names, walking through this graveyard is like walking through history. On this day, a tour of the cemetery and the bold-faced names of history. There are others here, not so famous, but whose lives are just as valuable to be remembered. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sean Brown. It all started with the curious Sean Brighty, a Brown University student who began with a class project on genealogy and ended up going deeper into the ground. I combed through all of the records from 1840 to 1902. On the grounds of the Presbyterian Church behind the cemetery in the equally historic Snyder Academy building, an audience invited by the Old First Historic Trust, the organization that oversees the grounds here. Sean told them what he learned as he was trying to find the plots of his own family members buried in that centuries old cemetery. His research into the church's old burial records unveiled 5,000 bodies buried and about 2,000 markers are here. But what is really surprising over in the far corner chained off in the segregated section called the island records show graves are missing that hundreds of these unmarked african-american burials lie in that corner under what's now the church parking lot what sean uncovered was many of the graves are well covered paved over by a driveway. The area built up around it includes the Union County Courthouse and a multi-story garage. Here lies early African Americans, both slave and free. Uh, you get individuals who actually own substantial amounts of property, which is very rare for an African American of the mid-19th century. The cemetery itself goes back to the late 1600s, um, but the earliest marked African American we grave we have is 1840. Uh, and there are only five marked African-American graves uh, out of the uh, over 350 African-American individuals buried there. Is the stone for Lafayette Boylston, uh, the one that actually labels him as colored, uh, which is really what started the whole examination of this part for me. Just the sheer number of unmarked graves, that some of those really might still be under the current driveway and that that was really really surprising so we do hope that we will have the funding available um, over the near future to be able to memorialize some of those people who are unmarked and, and not named but we'd like to do that well I didn't realize that here at the Presbyterian Church in Elizabeth New Jersey that there was a large number of African Americans who were church members worshipped and are buried on the grounds here and um, that we can honor honor them and hopefully look for a way of honoring them and that when you call their names they're remembered the stories do not continue to be told and it's so exciting that this young man has taken the time and brought forth this information that we can now honor those who are unnamed and those who have been a part of these communities. As for Sean, he started the project looking for his relatives. I found my family in the book originally. Last name Tuckers, some listed as Tukers. I have a family connection to Elizabethtown. Um, my ancestors actually were some of the original founders. So it appears he continues his family line of discovery. In Elizabeth, I'm Vanessa Tyler for Jersey Matters. Okay, thank you. I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint. Thank you. So, there was work that had begun before I came, but there's so much more work to be done because almost everyone that I, when I found out about it and I started talking with people about it, um, almost everyone that I talked with had not heard of it. I mean, people, uh, when I first got there, the chief of police, Chief Saka, came and brought uh, the director, the new director, um, Graves, to meet me. And we were walking in the cemetery and he was telling me about the history of the property. And so I said to him quietly, I said, do you know that there's 313 enslaved people buried in this cemetery in unmarked graves? 
And he looked at me and he said, no. I said, yes. He said, no. I said, yes. He said, I used to walk. This was my beat. I used to walk to the cemetery all the time. Everyone that I talked with, young, old, black, white, rich, poor, um, just did not know that the, those ancestors were buried in the cemetery. And so we started, as I began to share with people, everyone that I spoke with was supportive and wanted to respond and to do something. So we started a project to build a monument. We had the groundbreaking ceremony May the 1st of 2022. We had the actual unveiling of the monument June the 18th, 2023. And we will be celebrating the anniversary of the unveiling this June, June 23rd, 2024. Um, our first priority was to build a monument, to actually put something up so that people could see. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to actually have a physical uh, edifice up with their names engraved on it. We were able to do that, not only myself and the congregation, but the entire community, the city of Elizabeth, the county of Union, the state, so much support. Um, and so, and we're so very grateful, so very grateful for that support. So this is what the monument looks like. It's 23 feet tall. And as you can see on the front of it, um, we have names that are engraved. As we did our research, we found out that there was actually 381 free and enslaved African people who are buried in the cemetery. Of those names, about 117 to 120, we have the first and the last name, 40 to 50, we either have the first name or the last name, and the rest of them, we only had the date that they were buried, so they say unknown, unknown. Also, you will see around the monuments, um, hope that I'm not hiding it, we did a brick fundraiser, so around the monument, you'll see bricks that person, the people in the community purchased in honor or in memory of their loved one, um, our, the person who um, designed this was Sterling Brown, who was an amazing, amazing sculpturer. Um, this was a city, uh, city volunteer effort. All people from all over the place supported and came to honor and support the monument. Um, I want to say to you the image that you see of the person on the front of this, the man at the top. He's actually what this is an actual image of um, descendants of one of the ancestors whose name is Henry Vandiver. And we were so blessed and so honored that we have met the Vandiver descendants. They were actually at the unveiling of the monument. They were actually the parade leaders. Um, so it's just really exciting to not only have their names, to have them engraved, but to actually meet members of families. And our hope is that as we continue to do research that others may discover that they have family members who are buried in the cemetery. Our second priority was to continue the research. It didn't start, I didn't start this project. It was already going on as you saw a few minutes ago in the video with Sean Briotti. I first uh, was introduced to Rafael Rodriguez, a beautiful, amazing uh, brother who is an artist and he actually had an image. Uh, he said that to me that I see that this, this uh, monument is going to be a uh, black marble. It's going to have black marble and it's going to be shaped like a pyramid and it's going to have water flowing out of it. Um, he had an image of it. He did not draw it. And unfortunately he transitioned um, in, in uh, February of 2020. But I remember what he told me. And as we shared with the designers, I shared his image uh, and his, his dream for the monument. The Old First Historic Trust Board uh, did some amazing work uh, on the property, uh, doing restoring uh, the, uh, the markers in the, in the cemetery. Uh, the Snyder Foundation gave monies to do renovations at Snyder Academy. Um, so, so much work has been done, but there, there was more work to be done and there's still more work to be done. I met Dr. Linda Caldwell Epps during this time. She had also uh, done research. She was called by the, path, the previous pastor to help put together uh, documentation so that they could apply for grants and do work to, to understand and tell the stories of the ancestor. 
of course, you just saw Sean Brioli. So now I want to introduce you to four of the ancestors. What you see in front of you now is a page from the First Presbyterian Church burial book. The burial book is dated from 1766 to 1914. And this is the one that I want to highlight is here, Hannah. It says, Hannah, I hope you can see it. A free black. So you ask, how do we get the names? So the burial book, this book, had the name has the names of all of those who are buried in the cemetery. When is one of our ancestors, it either says black or it will say um, Negro or you'll, you may see another one now, colored, not Negro, colored is the, is the term that was used at that time. So Hannah was um, a free black and I thought this was interesting. You see that her age was 66. Her death was March the 11th, 1821. And the disease column does not list what she died from. So this is Hannah. I thought this is, Hannah is the only entry in this book where it indicates that one of our ancestors was free. The second one is the gentleman that I sh just showed you the picture of on the, on the monument, Henry Vandiver. And if you see right above, it says Henry Vandiver colored 62. This was April the 16th, 1845, and he died of consumption. Uh, Mr. Vandiver was the, 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 um, the descendants of the Vandivers were uh, entrepreneurs. Um, they, he had a moving company that he and his sons um, worked. And so I, I wanted to highlight him and just continue to call his name for his legacy because we actually have met those uh, of his descendants, which I think is an actually amazing thing. If you look up here, you might see this um, wife of Braddock Jones, colored. So this is another one of our ancestors. I don't know what this is, D-O, I'm not sure. So the next uh, ancestor that I'll introduce you to is Sarah Ann. So right above, you'll see here, Sarah Ann, again, colored girl. She was 14. She died um, July 29th, 1846, and she was burned to death. And the reason why I wanted to call Sarah Ann's name tonight is because one of my colleagues, Dr. Primrose Hammond, um, helped do some of the, the verification of the names and she, she Sarah Ann called to her. And so um, Dr., Dr. Hammond wanted to do research to find out what happened to Sarah Ann that she was burned to death. And she, had, she actually got a chance to do the research and find out more information about Sarah Ann. And then the last of the ancestors I would like to introduce you to is Lafayette Boylston. If you remember in the video, you were shown uh, his grave marker and in the top right corner, it's, it has C-O-L apostrophe D. And his marker is the only one in the cemetery that indicates that he was colored. Um, Lafayette Boylston, if you see the first entry on this page, Lafayette Boylston, colored, age 24, death was March the 30th, 1849. And it says that his disease was consumption. He died of consumption. Um, there are maybe less than 10 of the ancestors that are in a, have an actual marker. Lafayette Boston, mm -hmm. we know for sure because it says that he was colored. Our third priority was to expand the current museum. I mentioned at the beginning that I went into the museum and that's where I saw the picture that I showed you. So what we would like to do is actually expand this, make it larger to include the stories of the 313 plus ancestors in addition to the many other stories that are on the property. There, there is so much history there uh, and we want to expand this museum and make it an interpretive museum that includes all of those stories. So I'm gonna end with this picture because as you see that 
um, I'm holding in my hand a maquette of the mine of the monument. Um, and this is a group we took a maquette. The idea was that we would take the ancestors back home symbolically to Africa. So we are in Ghana. Uh, we went in January. There were, I think, 10 of us that went and we presented the maquette to the Paramount chief in the Akrapong, Akrapim region. Um, the interesting thing that happened though was we all agreed that we did not take the ancestors back home. They took us back home. We had an incredible experience of, I, I, there are no words. What I will say to everyone who is listening, go back to your ancestral home, wherever that is. Go back and reclaim the power, the strength of who you are. Find out your name, your legacy, your story. Because if it were not for those who came before us, we would not be here. We stand on someone's shoulder. So why do, why do we do this? Why do we call their names? We call their names because we need them. We need their strength. We, we want to honor them and thank them for everything that they've done, that we are here. And even more important than that, we have the responsibility to do it for the next generation. So we have to learn the history. We have to understand the journey we have to understand who we are and what we bring as a people that we are so that we can share with our children so that they can share with their children. So I'm so grateful uh, for this opportunity. Um, one of the things that we did, as I mentioned to you, we had a brick fundraiser and I invite you to purchase a brick in honor or in memory of someone that you love of an organization um, we're still working to pay for the fullness of the brick project, the monument project that we built. So this is the website that you can go to. It's with Bricks R Us. And you can purchase an eight by eight brick, which is $100, or a 12 by 12 brick, which is $300. You can also get a donation brick for yourself or a certificate. All of the bricks that are purchased uh, by May the 10th will be installed by our next event, which will be June the 23rd. So we invite you to help us to continue um, completing the project by purchasing a brick or two or three. Also, I just wanna let you know that on June the 23rd, we will have the anniversary of the unveiling of the monument. It's also the Juneteenth celebration and our theme is Sounds of the African Diaspora. If you go to this website, you will be able to see all of that information. This is in memory of Rafael Rodriguez. He um, left us February the 21st, 2020, but we call his name and we remember him and we thank him for all of the work that he has done. Thank you for uh, listening and thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Reverend Lundy. Um, so, I would like to um, have everyone join us now. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please type them in the Q&A or chat and um, Rachel will read them um, to us. Um, I know Reverend Lundy indicated that she wasn't from um, New Jersey in our conversation the other day, but it's so um, powerful to hear both of your stories um, and to see someone who is from this area taking on the story and someone who's not from here taking on the story um, of reclaiming um, these necessary stories in, in a landscape that has virtually erased them. Um, you know, Elizabeth and Hoboken and Newark are all industrial spaces that have kind of, in many ways, wiped away the early histories of the folks who've worked um, and lived in these towns. And I think there's something that we're doing that's making our landscapes more real by bringing these stories um, to our communities. 
I want to say, I'm sorry, but I want to say, um, um, Reverend Lundy, thank you so very much. Um, I, I'm very moved um, by the work that you do. It's very, very powerful. So thank you for, for sharing it. I say thank you. I, um, gentrification is this, this uh, wow. We're attacked on so many fronts. And that one is one that sort of eases, slips in at night. You know, and before you know it, the whole community has changed. And things are happening so fast now that you sort of forget about the people who are impacted. We hear about fires every day. And, you know, people's lives are impacted and changed by that in so many different ways. So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Likewise, I am I am uplifted and inspired by you, Dr. Lundy. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate this opportunity that the historical uh, commission is providing, you know, um, our young people. It, it, it was just amazing to me. Even today I saw in the chat, someone said that they're from Elizabeth and they, they didn't know the story. Mm -hmm. We have to tell the stories, whatever, whether, whether we think they are positive or negative, it's not even a value judgment. The, the truth is the truth and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Um, mm -hmm. It will at least empower you and help you to understand maybe why things are happening the way they happen. So, yeah. I think a big part of, uh, you know, you know, when I initially started this project and I did, I was doing my own independent research, the thing that struck me the most and why it's so powerful that to hear you speak, I can relate, you know, in that, in, in the saying of the name, say their mm -hmm. say their name and so you know one of the things that impacted me most and was sort of the impetus for me to start this work is is that when i was reading these names in these newspapers that were many times spelled wrong i knew i knew that this was it this was the end of the line this just might be the last person that ever says this person or writes this person's name and I felt it was the thing that struck with me the mo stuck with me the most, and it gave me it made me feel pain. And so I knew that I just had made a decision to not let it be that way because that's not any kind of way to rest in peace. You know, we say to each other, "Rest in peace," right? Yeah. But what does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean, right? And what part do we have? in bringing about that piece, you know? Yeah, I know I know. for me, one of the points in, in convening this, um, besides sharing the information, was to inspire other people to um, work on stories that of the dispossessed or the stories um, of folks who generally are um, not embraced, the, the stories of our ancestors. Um, as um, Reverend Dr. Lundy said, um, it gives us strength, but it also, I think when we live in these areas, we know there is more, there's more history, there's more knowledge to know, but we don't see it. And so, but the yearning, like when I walk the streets of Hoboken, you know, over the past, you know, 48 years, those, you hear the stories but you can't see them, you know? Yeah. Um, so Ra I guess, Rachel, do you wanna share some of the questions from the question and answer? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I would like to say that there's tons of thank yous coming in the chat. Um, and personally, I'd like to extend a thank you as well. These were really powerful and moving projects and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be learning more. And what you were saying, Noel, about the next generation actually dovetail perfectly into two questions that we've received. Um, the first one being, what advice would you give young people getting into public history? I, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think it's imperative that young people are told the stories um, 
they have told their own personal stories in their own families. Um, then they learn about the, the, the history and the stories around them. And the fact of the matter is they do it already. They don't do it as formally as we do it. So one way to do it is to show them, to, to expose them. Um, and, and there's so many different ways to do it, um, doing it informally or formally, but to expose young people and to help them to see that they're already doing it and giving them an opportunity um, to share their stories, to do interviews with people in their families. Um, that's one that I think is really important um, to, to have the youngest person interview the oldest person and one of the questions that I love to ask seniors is, what kind of games did you play when you were growing up? You know, what what did you what did you do when you were when you were a child? You know, so I think just sort of introducing in that way that this is history. You know, this these are the stories, and then it can advance uh, even more more than that. That's that's one way I think to get them young people started. And. And I, I would add that um, um, here, ask yourself this question. If you don't do it, what do you have to lose? What will you lose if you don't? And make it personal. It is personal. Whatever history that you're going to go research, get involved in it, what 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 place what place is there for you? Where is your place? It needs to be personal. Then you'll find, you know, then you'll you'll be asking your questions. It's not so broad. It's not like, you know, where do I start? If you don't know where if you don't know where you start, then <laughs> you know. Agree with you one hundred. You know where you start, and it's how you're going to keep it up. Yeah. Right. You know what's the next step because how it's going to start is a thing that feels, at least for myself, is a feel a thing that feels beyond me. Almost like I'm left with no choice. Thank you both. Uh, there's another question that is slightly related, but you know, there's a, a different nuance to it. They're wondering if you have any recommendations for getting children interested in ancestral healing. I could say something here. Yes. Um, I had this wonderful opportunity recently. Um, and there, 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 there's a subject um, of the history of the gentrification of the city and the arson fires that is uh, a person who died who is uh, is a per is personal to me, right? And um, I had uh, done a lot of research on her. I was able to find her family and uh, break ground with them, break bread with them, be a part of their family, in a way, in the time that we had. Um, and so through this research, this woman who died in this fire, she died, she died with her whole, with her whole family. It was her and her husband and her father and her four children. And before her death, she had become an activist. This woman's name is Ana Mercado. She became an activist and um, she organized one of the first night watches in her building to make sure that they didn't get burned out in the middle of the night. And, you know, I spoke with people that knew this woman, right? And they were like, man, you would never think that this woman would do this. This was not her. She was shy, you know, she was kind of, you know, it just it blows your mind that, that she did this, this activism, this organizing. When I go to her family for the first day that I'm going to meet them, which is also the first day that I ever got to see her picture because her picture had not been published. Faceless. 
you know, I see her and I'm like, man, Anna, I, you know, I've been traced, you know, it's been like, it's like two years saying your name and I have no proof of your life. And now here I am, right? And then I tell them about her activism. And it's the first time they ever heard it. If I don't walk through that door, it's a large chance, there's a great chance that they never knew that this, this beautiful person, an aunt, a sister, was this activist. And so I had this opportunity recently where the library, the public library came to me and they were like, hey, Chris, uh, can you give us any people like historical figures, right? So that we could do things with kids. And I was like, Ana, Ana Mercado. And so I wrote about Ana as an activist in a city. And now they have it and it's like a coloring book page. They ain't know, you know, they ain't know, you, this, you, you have to understand, we this close, we this close. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That close, it's that close. And now it is. And who knows where else Ana Mercado goes? I can tell you if you Google her name, you're going to get to my website on Google, first page. Hello. She's back. It's beautiful. I, I, I want to answer the question in this way. I took my daughter on a civil rights tour when she was 10. Um, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if she was too young to go because we were going to all of these places that that was story, horrendous stories, stories of the South, right? She was a trooper. She, 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 she was with us. We were only gone for a week. We went to a different state every night. When we got to uh, Mumphy, I'm sorry, to uh, Mississippi, um, where to Glendora, Mississippi, where Emmett Till's, the Emmett Till Museum is, she she had no problem. She she went in she, because she was learning the history. What you know, she understood it as much as she could at, at ten years old. When we got to Memphis, Tennessee, and went to the the museum in Memphis, she came to me and she said, "Mom, I don't want to go in." I said, "You don't have to go. You don't have to go, sweetie." She had heard so much and she had gotten so much that she herself was able to say, I can't take any more. I don't want to hear any more, you know, about people dying and this kind of thing. Um, I want to tell you then, five years later, I took her back on the same trip. Um, and she was one of the tour guides. <laughs> she, because she, she, she could tell the story. She, she had experienced it. Um, I think sometimes we don't want to tell our children at an early age things because we, we think that um, they're too young, they might not understand, it might impact them. The fact of the matter is they know more than we give them credit to, for knowing already. And it's better they hear about the history from us than from someone else who may not be telling them the whole story. The second part of that I, I would like to share is that we, as, as, especially as African-Americans, uh, African people in the diaspora, our story does not start as enslaved people. That's, that's not our whole story. Our story starts in Africa. So I think it's incumbent upon us as adults that we begin to tell the story to our children of who we are, where we've come from, that history, their legacy, their strength, that they are powerful people, that their history is much more than even the story, that some, the, the bad story that does not want to be told to them in some ways, in some places. So yeah, it's important that we, that we empower our young people by helping them to learn their names and their stories. It will strengthen them and help take them through these days that we have ahead of us. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Brandon. Oh. oh, Rachel, are you gonna share Adriana's um, questions? Yeah, so uh, we have a couple of questions that are just about Hoboken and then we'll go back to um, a general question for the group. So um, first of all, um, if Reverend Lundy and Chris, you are comfortable with sharing your contact information, there are some folks who are interested in that. 
if you're not, no worries, but if you are, you can drop it in the chat. And then in terms of um, the story with Hoboken, uh, we have two questions that I'll, they're about the continuation of the story, so I'll share both of them. First of all, um, were those who caused the fires ever prosecuted? And did the city of Hoboken ever acknowledge or apologize for the harm towards the community members who died? Uh, to the first question, no. No one was ever prosecuted. Uh, for the second question, yes. Um, meagerly. <laughs> uh, in 2023, during the time of my exhibition, a, a plaque was installed um, that mentioned the fires and said that the fires were intentional, which I thought was, you know, good of the city. But outside of that plaque, no. It's small. It's on a gate. <laughs> Certainly not the monument that's in Elizabeth, but that, now that's a monument. That's a monument that we should all be proud of. I think that, um, you know, relatively small amount of recognition dovetails into another question that we received. Uh, and this would be um, for both of you. How do we get local and state politicians to understand that the current um, New Jersey redevelopment policy is erasing the history that is speaking, that we're speaking about in this conversation? Buildings are you know, being demolished and green areas are being built that, uh, on that which the ancestors built. Yeah, I think about I think about that question a lot, maybe in a, a different kind of way. But when you think about it, literally everywhere we walk, we're walking on someone. <laughs> you know, generally we and and for me that that makes me more purposeful. Um it makes me more purposeful. I mean, it's said that it's in because of progress. It's the um and I think that's even more reason why we must teach ourselves to call the names, to remember and to honor our ancestors. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that one, except that I think about how, you know, we have places that are intentionally designed for us to honor our, our dead to bury them so that they have a place, so that we have a place that we can go and visit them, so that they have a place that they can have as their last resting place. Um, and those are, those are, we need those. But even with those, there are people who, who are not buried, you know, who, who are not given the kind of respect in their burial. So I don't know how to answer that question. I would say um, you got to show up, you know, you have to, you know, when you have, you know, attend city council meetings, know what's going on in your city, know what's going on in your neighborhood, you know what I mean? Um, speak up. Um, it's not easy because, you know, If if where you're at, you know, the 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 people that have the keys to the city, the people that have the power decide, you know, if they choose profit over people, if they choose that, then it's a really tiring, 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 tiring process, you know. And everybody has to work. Everybody's gotta go to work. Everybody's gotta fend for themselves. It's exhausting. And it it could wear you out, but you take it as far as you can get. I know a lot of wonderful people in Hoboken that are fighting that fight day in and day out. Um, my work is not just a historical one. I'm up to date on what's going on in the city today and I'm covering it, I'm documenting it. I'm talking about how gentrification continues, how displacement continues through manipulation, through rezoning, 
demolition contract craziness just to like demo a building where there's like rent stabilized units. That's happening right now, Hoboken right now. There's a city council meeting that's being held today that will decide on the demolition of three buildings that will displace 16 um, rent stabilized units within those three buildings. That's not 16 people. <laughs> that's 16 whole places. That's more than 16 people. That's families. Because they want to build condos, something like that. It is. And then, you know, the city, the city will be like, oh, the meetings at five got postponed and now it's at six, log in through Zoom, and then they reschedule and they do all the craziness to confuse everybody to get everybody's the attendance numbers down. It's exhausting. Hoboken Fair Housing Association put up a good fight. Do good work. Try to get people to show up. There's one remaining uh, public housing projects in Hoboken, always under threat. Privatization. We know that that's happening in New York City as well. Trying to privatize the, the last the public housing. They're coming for everybody. And when people doesn't really, when people, I mean, I, the thing is, you know, especially with my project, you know, like what I try to do is at least what my intentionality is, you know, I have a long way to go. It's a work in progress. It's an ever, ever growing project where I'm learning. The project changes, saying new things, but essentially it's like to share these stories, right? To share these stories of lives lived, lives lost, and lives, people who continue to live and who continue to fight, right? But to be able to hear the toll, the human toll, that these choices, how impactful they are when you decide to burn down a building, when you decide to desecrate, what it really means on an individual basis. Because there may be in that, there's a hope that you can be like, damn, you know, that's kind of that's kind of like me. That's a little bit like that's personal. That's like kind of like me. And now look at all that that came about that. And so then you hear about this story. And hopefully with any hope, you could circle back and be like, but what is this all about? Why did this, what are we talking about here? What was all this? That's about a house. That's about housing. <laughs> everything you just read, everything you just learned is about housing. Now what? Those are the questions. And then, you know, how, how much you get involved. I mean, again, it's exhausting. They'll wear you thin. They have the money to wear you thin. litigation this that and the third you know what i mean but be present love your neighbor be kind be just tell your story it's worth it if you don't it's dangerous it's dangerous to not that's another thing that i recognized when i started this project the danger in not doing it I'm sorry, Dr. Lundy, but I can't hear you. There's an African proverb that says, the story of the hunt will always favor the hunter until the lion begins to tell the story. And so it is so true in many different ways that we, we can't be silent. We have to tell the stories and we must teach our young people. Yep. We can't yep. blame them for not knowing, not doing, not acting if we don't prepare them to do it. And how are you talking about, like, how do I prepare? I don't know what that question is, but you prepare how to teach ki kids about this history. I don't know exactly what that's about, right? But it's like, don't censor these things, right? And like, it, and it starts from home. You want to you wanna, you wanna teach your young people about history? Then it starts from home, you know? Say what it is, whatever it is. It has to be said because it'll, you know, so many people through the process of, you know, meeting these families that have suffered, have lost so much. You know what I mean? You know, they, they carry around the shame of essentially getting the boot from a city that they gave everything to. That's really, really painful. Who do you tell that to? How do you begin that conversation? It's not an easy one to do. And that's why it's like, 
I feel like, you know, I've created the space. I've created the space for them to say it. It's like the reason. They're like, oh, because you asked. I think it's I think it's just so powerful also with the two of you, as well as other folks in the audience, is translating these things to culture and material and making these connections. Yeah. So it's like we could share the information in um lectures or talks, but for you to create the photographs, um, for Christopher to show the books in the exhibition. Um, to see the, the, the writing on the wall. Um, and then with Reverend Dr. Lundy and the 313 Project and all the folks, Linda, Dr. Epps and everyone to retrieve these names and even just to have the folks who are unnamed is to, mm -hmm. to create this like material reality where folks can move closer to their like health and sanity because they know the story is there. And I think it's so important when we talk about diversity, inclusivity, and all of these other things is that this isn't, um, this isn't just a process of, oh, like we should do this story, this person's story, this person's story. What we're doing is actually rectifying the historical record. So, so far the story has not necessarily been true, right? Yeah. So it's not just an additive story a lot of us are doing, it's that we're actually sharing the truth of the story, um, the truth of resilience, the truth of someone like Miss Mercado standing up you know, mm -hmm. when there may be children who are like, who who stood up for us, you know? Um, so I want to thank you both um, for presenting tonight. I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank all of the communities that have helped y'all get to where, where mm -hmm. you have gotten your mm -hmm. collaborators the supporters, the volunteers who didn't do research, who just showed up, the folks who um, donated money, the institutions yeah. who um, stood up to do this because it's they folks do not stand up because it's um, easy. They we all they all take a chance by standing up and supporting these stories. So oh. I want to thank all of them. Um, thank, thank you to the audience for coming tonight. Thank you to my um, co-workers, um, Rachel and Sarah Kiriton, um at the New Jersey Historical Commission. Um, and um, we will record this um, program and it will be added to our YouTube channel. As a part of all of the recordings, we will have links to the programs, um, Dr. Lundy, um, has encouraged you all to visit the site, come um, visit the installation, see how you would like to be engaged as a part of the monument and supporting the monument um, in promoting this important history. And um, as well as Christopher's exhibition is now at Centro. Um, and there's still information, I believe, on the Hoboken Museum site as well as Centro. So we will share that information as well. Um, and I think it's important for you, everyone, to go bring your students and also use it in the classroom um, as models for how folks can do public history. Um, and so um, if um, there isn't, well, I'm sure we all have more to say, but... Um, on that note, I will just say good evening and um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Nola. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lundy. It's so wonderful to learn about your work. I hope we stay connected. Thank everybody here. Okay, so you'll, you all will get an email from me. Everyone actually will get an email from me. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ashe.